First, let me introduce Professor Sai Prakash. Professor Prakash's scholarship focuses on separation of powers, particularly executive powers. Prakash's most recent book, The Living Presidency, an originalist argument against its ever-expanding powers, was published by Harvard Belknap Press in 2020. At the request of Democrats and Republicans, he has testified before Congress on matters of presidential removal, the Mueller report, and how Congress might better check the presidency. Professor Prakash received his undergraduate degree from Stanford University and his law degree from Yale Law School. He subsequently clerked for, Lawrence, or for Judge Lawrence H. Silberman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and for Justice Clarence Thomas of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, next, Professor Ben Johnson is an associate professor of law at the University of Florida, Florida Levin College of Law. Professor Johnson researches and writes on corporate governance, corporate finance, and constitutional law. His recent work on the Supreme Court has been published in the Columbia Law Review and the Alabama Law Review. Earlier work on district judges with financial conflicts led to a large expose in the Wall Street Journal. He has ongoing projects on the Supreme Court's shadow docket, corporate fiduciary duties, shareholder voting, and machine learning. Professor Johnson holds a law degree from Yale Law School and a PhD in politics from Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. And we will begin with Professor Prakash. Well, it's great to be here with you today. Um, I'm so happy Ben Johnson is here with us as well. Uh, he flew in this morning and he's flying out this afternoon. So we're really lucky to have him here. I, I mean, if he's come all the way up here just for this, we are uh, in his debt. I met Ben about, uh, he says, 15 years ago. Uh, time flies at the Yale Law School. I was giving a talk there. And I, what, were you the president, Ben, of the Fed Sock chapter? Vice president. For that. Vice president. We're just going to promote you to president. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't remember what I talked about. Uh, ben doesn't either. Um, <laughs> But I do remember that we went around the law school for a couple hours afterwards, just chit-chatting, and, and then um, I, we went and talked to Professor Amar, who was my professor and my, and my mentor. And I, I think Ben and I had a great time uh, hearing why I was wrong from Professor Amar. Um, so today, uh, FedSoc has asked me to speak about originalism. And I think this means that uh, Professor Solem and Professor Nelson, Professor Harrison, and many others were unavailable. Uh, so, <laughs> You know, you're stuck with me. Um, I'll be speaking about why someone might be an originalist, and I think Ben will be speaking about the how of doing it. Of course, you know, I might have some comments about his topic, and he might have some comments about mine. Um, so let me just sort of begin with a story, right? Let's, uh, let's uh, imagine that uh, you are with your loving but demanding grandfather, and your grandfather is very sick and uh, perhaps uh, on his deathbed. Call him Grandpa Joe. I don't have a Grandpa Joe. Uh, never did. So he whispers uh, to you, he says, come here, come here. And you go over there because you're very dutiful. You get up out of your chair and you lean in and Grandpa Joe says, can you make me a promise? Can you make me a promise? And you nod your head because you, know, you, should, you should agree to the promise, even though you don't know what it is. Uh, he then hoarsely whispers to you, keep off the grass. You say, sure, 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 <laughs> sure. Uh, do you have to honor the promise? What does your promise mean? I don't think originalism is about whether you have to honor the promise. Whether you choose to follow grandpa's law or contract or admonition, I think will turn on many different factors. And I don't think originalism has anything to say about that. But suppose you actually want to follow the promise, and you ask yourself, what does it mean? And then I tell you more about your grandpa, Joe. You should know this, but apparently you don't in this hypothetical. He was an ardent opponent of marijuana. And he lived in Phoenix, where there is no grass. Well, there are rock gardens, right? They have rules against grass in Phoenix, because it's just a waste. Right? The desert is beautiful without grass. So you know that he means marijuana. He does not mean fescue or bluegrass or what are the other kinds of grasses? I don't know. Tall grass, short grass, pink grass. Um, so you know what he means by this, right? Can you decide 
to just avoid walking on fescue or bluegrass and suppose that you are honoring his wishes, honoring your commitment to him? Can you smoke weed or eat marijuana brownies to your heart's content and believe you're honoring your commitment to him? Can you say, I'm going to follow the rule for 10 years and then decide 10 years later, well, what it meant when I, when he uttered the words and when I agreed to follow his admonition, what it meant then is not something is not relevant to what it means today or what it ought to mean today. So I followed this, you know, I followed what I took him to mean for 10 years, but things have changed. And marijuana just looks so much more attractive to me now. <laughs> or I'm, you know, you know, I have reasons, right, for wanting to take marijuana that are medical or otherwise. And if you do that, are you honoring his commitment? Um, so now let me leave grandpa aside. I think originalism narrowly understood is a theory of interpretation. I don't think it is a theory regarding the legitimacy of legal texts or simple texts. I don't think it can tell you what constitution is our law, right? Uh, I don't think it, it can tell you that the Articles of Confederation, which was the framework before the constitution, I don't think it can tell you that it's not our law, and I don't think it can tell you that the constitution that you get from Westlaw or that you'll find at the beginning of your constitutional law casebook is our law. Um, but I think it can tell you what both of those things mean. Uh, and obviously, I don't think it can tell you whether you have to honor your commitment to your grandfather. Um, but as I've suggested, it can tell you what the prior commitment means. So how do we make sense of texts and utterances? One way is to suppose that the meaning of texts and utterances is not a product of its speaker and its era, but in instead is supposed to turn on what we what we ought to take the, the text or the utterance to mean. Right? A law enacted over 100 years ago can or should mean something different today, even if the law was never amended. Um, I'll call this a living theory of meaning. And it is appealing to many, particularly when we're talking about the Constitution, which of course is something that's mostly from over 200 years ago. Um, why is it appealing? Because the Constitution was written for a different era, for different problems. We have different problems today than we did in the past. Uh, we have different preferences than people did in the past. If we can re-understand the Constitution to better suit our needs, that is a good thing. We can honor our commitment to it and um, also update it. Right? We can smooth out its flaws and make it better, preserve, better serve our perceived needs. And we can call this a theory of living or dynamic interpretation, right? People are aware of the idea of a living constitution, and people may be aware of the idea of dynamic statutory interpretation. And so this can be applied to treaties, uh, constitutions, statutes, executive branch rules, judicial precedents, really any sort of any sort of utterance, even a letter, right? You could apply this sort of theory to it, right? Um, I think originalism is a theory that privileges the, the context of the lawmaker, whoever they are. Originalists ask what, the, what was the meaning of the law at the time of enactment, be it last week, a decade ago, or centuries ago. Um, as, as you may be aware, originalism seeks to discover an original meaning. This can be hard in many cases, maybe even impossible in some. Why is that? Because the meaning of words and phrases changes over time, and to try to reconstruct the meaning of some phrase or word from many Decades ago, decades ago, let alone centuries ago, can be very, very difficult. And of course, you know, there were likely contested meanings and, and various meanings at the time of enactment, right? There's it's often, like, you know, we, we, we understand this today, right? If Congress passes a law today, there will be disagreements about the meaning. There won't be a single sense of the meaning of, of its various provisions. Um, there are many different ways of understanding how to decide what something meant what its original meaning was. One way is to talk about original intent. What were the lawmakers trying to accomplish? Um, another way is original public meaning, which I think involves asking what a uh, member of the public would take the law to mean at the time of enactment. Another way is um, what is sometimes called original methods originalism, which is asking what were the tools of interpretation that were extant at the round at the time of enactment, and then just using those to try to generate a meaning or multiple meanings. 
So at this point, let me return to uh, the why and grandpa. Um, what sense is there in saying you are honoring grandpa's wishes if you take them to mean something other than what he meant by them? It seems to me it defeats the purpose of agreeing to follow his admonition, his, de his deathbed wish. If you can have it mean whatever best suits you as the interpreter. Grasses can be lawns or even better, something you detest like broccoli. Right? And, or spiders, which you have no intention of uh, stepping on or eating. That will be an easy rule to follow. But what is the point of doing that? If you treat grass as lawns or broccoli, you are really just doing what you want to do and are no longer, it seems to me, interpreting much less following his deathbed wish. You are just making it up as you go along. Uh, there's really no point in pretending that you're honoring his wish. So let me uh, apply this to, the, to our Constitution. Uh, what is the point of applying the Constitution as written by dead white males? If you can reinterpret it as you see fit. Right? The treason clause, which you're all aware of because you've read the Constitution, right? Uh, if you're first years, you will read the Constitution if you haven't already. It says you need two witnesses or a confession in court. Well, what if someone were to say, look, that was fine back then, but uh, it's hard to find witnesses these days. It's harder like, to make some sort of empirical claim. It should be one witness. And when we say it's one witness, we are still honoring the clause in some sense. What's the point of that? What's the point of saying you're going to follow the clause, but have it take on a meaning that's um, at variance from, from what it would have been in the past? Or take something like the contracts clause. Contracts clause is found in Article 1, Section 10, and it says states can't impair the obligation, the obligations of contracts. And they enacted it because they saw that states were, uh, before the Constitution, states were changing the terms of contracts after they were made uh, to make them less onerous to the debtor. And if you're a debtor, and many of you are because you are student, <laughs> um, you could see why this might be a good thing for you. Like, well, you know, it says I have to pay, pay it off in 10 years. It would be great if I could take 20 or 30 or 40. Um, it says, you know, I have to pay in dollars, but I'd rather pay in, you know, some other currency that, you know, I convert to now and that will be depreciated by the time I have to pay it. Right? It could, you know, if you, if you can capture the legislature, you can have them enact changes to the contract that are to your benefit. So they, did, they wanted to stop that, right? If, if the contract required you know, payment in, in gold or silver. Uh, they wanted to prevent the legislature from saying you can use paper dollars. Um, and why would you want gold or silver? Because uh, that would presumably depreciate less than paper dollars, at least at the time. I mean, our currencies, our paper dollars are, are a little more stable in recent times, say for the last two or three years. Um, the Supreme Court in a case called Blaisdell said, Contracts clause meant something in the past. We know what it meant, but why does it have to mean that today? Yeah, we don't. We don't take it to mean that today. And uh, I think a lot of people celebrate uh, that uh, decision, and it seems natural or obvious to them. But in what sense are we honoring the contracts clause if we just have it mean what best suits our perception of what's optimal today? I, I don't really think you're following the contracts clause. We're just choosing to ignore it in the guise of, of reinterpreting it. So let me give a, another hypothetical, because uh, you know that's all I can do as a professor. I, I know nothing really about the real world. Um, let's suppose that uh, pro-choice uh, folks amend the Constitution, and they add to the 28th Amendment, and it says abortion shall be legal throughout the United States. And, and people understand this means that people can abort a fetus or a baby right, without legal restriction. For 10 years, they follow that. But then imagine some clever pro-life professor says, and he, he or she's not an originalist. That's what it meant then, but why do we have to take it to mean that now? Why do we have to take it to mean that now? I don't think we do. We can honor the commitment to this uh, provision, and we'll, we'll read abortion as covering rocket launches. Right? Everybody has a right to abort a uh, rocket launch. And that honors the commitment to this provision. And of course that's not what they meant, but I mean, why do we care what they meant? That's the past, right? And of course, the longer the past is, uh, the more distance the past is, the, the less uh, we're gonna be wanting, uh, the less willing we are to be bound by it. Would this be interpreting this um, 
provision or would it be uh, changing it in the guise of interpretation? And would it be honoring the provision or would it just be going through the motions of honoring it, but really not honoring it? Um, what is this example meant to show? I, I think it's meant to show that I, th I don't think originalism is conservative or liberal. Uh, there are conservatives who aren't originalists and there are liberals who are. Right? Um, I have colleagues here who are you know, conservative or libertarian. They're not originalists. They, they think it's silly or wrong-headed. And then, of course, there are people like Professor Amar, who's a committed liberal, who's an originalist. Professor Balkin at Yale is a, a committed originalist, and he's also liberal. So there's nothing about the theory, I think, that is necessarily uh, conservative or, uh, or libertarian. I think it's often identified with those uh, perspectives because it's most prominently applied to a constitution, which is in turn fairly conservative and libertarian, right? At least in the following sense, it has a bunch of rules written in the past that conserve some old order, and then it has a lot of protections for property and contract, right? Some of which you might think wouldn't be in the constitution if we rewrote it today. So it tends to be, in fact, conservatives and libertarians who tend to be originalists, and, and that's partly a, a product of the Constitution that we have. Um, if liberals wrote a new Constitution today and got a lot of stuff into it that they really liked, like a welfare right or abortion right or what have you, I think many of them would be originalists. And I think at least some conservatives wouldn't be anymore. Uh, and that's... Uh, Shame on both of those people that don't, you know, this hypothetical shame on both of them. But um, the point is, you know, some people's commitment to originalism isn't, it's, it's really a reflection of, I think, the document they're interpreting and not some more deeper connection to the theory. Um, so I, I don't know how long I've been talking, but I'll end with three loose ends. Um, I, I know you think it's been too long, and I, I tend to agree. Um, so why am I an originalist? I've always been one. Uh, before I came to law school, you know, when I was in high school, we'd read a book and someone would say, what does the, what does the book mean? And I'd say, well, whatever the author was trying to convey. <laughs> I don't know what it is because I cannot fathom what this piece of fiction means. That was often the case <laughs> with me. But it's whatever they were trying to convey. Now, of course, that's, that's not necessarily the case. Or it could be the case, but it could be more complicated because sometimes the author may be trying to convey, my book means whatever you take it to mean. Uh, and that makes literature, I think, different than legal texts. I don't think any lawmaker ever says, I'm writing a bunch of words down, spending hours of, uh, thinking about it, and it means whatever you want it to mean. Because you don't need a text to do that which you want to do, right? I mean, no, no, I don't need like a, a, a letter from Risa saying, do whatever you want to do today. <laughs> I do that anyway. <laughs> right? So there would be no point in her writing that down and no point thinking about it for days or weeks and then voting on it. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I've always had this view, um, and I continue to have it today, that the meaning of a text is what the author intends, um, and you know, whether it's a plural author or a singular author. And there's a separate question of why do I care? Right? Do I treat this as law or not? And I think that's a separate question. Um, that originalism, in my understanding of the, of the word, doesn't answer. Originalism is a theory of interpretation, not a theory of legitimacy or why we ought to care uh, about grandpa or Congress or uh, people in Philadelphia or people at the ratifying conventions. So I just said that um, uh, there are originalists who disagree. Right, there are people who say originalism is both a theory of interpretation and a theory of legitimacy. And so uh, Kurt Lash, a friend of mine, uh, has said, you know, originalism, um, the Constitution is a product of popular sovereignty, meaning the people made it. We, the people, right, made the Constitution. And, and so originalism has a reason for why you ought to be, uh, you know, ought to be an originalist and ought to follow it. And I think, you know, there's sort of two responses one is, what do you mean we, Kimasabi? Right? Um, you know, most people at the time could not vote. Uh, you had to be a property or a white male to vote. So there were white males that weren't allowed to vote. And of course, there were white and black females 
uh, Indians who were not allowed to vote. And so, it, you know, it, it was, you know, Professor Marr would say it was the most democratic constitution ever, which is true at the time. Um, but you might think it, it's not very democratic as things go, given all the people that were excluded. Um, but, I, you know, I think originalism gives us a, a means of making sense of texts that aren't you know, democratically legitimate. I can try to make sense of the Articles of Confederation, even though it's really a treaty. Um, and so I, I think it's a mistake to conflate what something is with whether we ought to follow it. I think um, you, have, you can have good reasons for following the original Constitution. You can have bad reasons. Um, um, but I don't think originalism actually speaks to that. And then um, let me say one final thing. Can someone be an originalist and oppose the Constitution? Of course, because if it's just a theory of interpretation, you might say, I understand what the Constitution means. I've, you know, I've spent a lot of time with it, thinking about what it would have meant back then. And I don't think it's very good, right? Um, so of course you can be an originalist and be opposed to the Constitution, just like you can be an originalist and be opposed to the Confederate Constitution. Right? You're not committed to the Confederate Constitution because you're an originalist any more than you're committed to the Soviet Constitution or any other legal document. Um, so, you know, I think it turns out that most originalists like the Constitution, and so people just think, um, sorry, they like the original Constitution, and so they, they complain the two, but I think they're different. In any event, I think I've talked enough. I don't think I've quite talked 20 minutes, but uh, you'll, you'll have a chance to ask more questions, so that's great. Well, thank you, Cy, and uh, 15 years into learning from you, and it continues. I hope that I have at least 15 more. Um, and uh, I, I kind of want to pick up where you left off there. Right? So I completely agree that, um, at least as a theory of interpretation, um, the fact that one can do the work as an originalist and understand what the Constitution means does not commit you in any meaningful sense to like actually defend support whatever this constitution right but if you're a judge right and you've taken the oath to support and defend the constitution i think the oath seems to be doing some work there right so now i think it's it's a it's a different question perhaps to say like me just sitting in an academic seminar like can i understand what the constitution means yes and can i think that's a really dumb idea yes and can i work like in my you know my personal life and in my voting and whatever else to like amend the constitution or start a revolution or whatever the case may be sure right but if i my job is to go to work and operate as a judge right it seems to me i've got like i've got three options and only two of them are honorable so one is i can fulfill my oath the other is i can resign because i can't in good faith fulfill this oath but what strikes me as like not an honorable thing would be to say, well, you know, I took this oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, and I know what it means, but I think it's dumb, and so I'm going to abuse the power of the office that was given to me by that Constitution in order to subvert it. Um, we can have interesting conversations about the ethics of revolutionaries and whatnot, but let's be honest, at that point, you're being a revolutionary, you're not being a judge, right? And so I think, like, so everything you said is exactly correct, um, from like an academic kind of objective point of view, but I think where the rubber meets the road for a lot of people is in the courtroom, right? When a judge has to make a decision, and there I think it's a little harder, right? But I don't think it's actually that hard. So I was talking to a judge yesterday, and, and he said, you know, I think when I think of the word originalism, I think it really should just be called constitutional law, right? And my, and my, my objection to that was I don't know what the word constitutional is doing in there. I think it's just law. Right. So um, like here I, I teach corporations. All right. So here's this class. Here's a quick case that I teach it's called Automatic Self-Cleaning Filter Syndicate Co. Limited. I really was hoping this was like the first vacuum company <laughs> because it's from 1906, like the UK, but it's not. It's a uh, purifying and storing liquids. Uh, v. Cunningham. I'm, I'm sure it's pronounced Cunningham, but it has the AME and I really want it to be Cunningham. So we're going to use that for today. Um, and so what is this case about? So this is a company, there's 2,700 shares, and this guy, um, McDermott, owns or controls 1,502 of them, right? So he has a clear majority of the shares. And he wants, you all know this case, you're using this case in corporate? So there's a, he wants to sell the corporate assets, right? Like he wants to sell this stuff, like I'm gonna be able to turn this into cash right now, I wanna make that happen. And the board <laughs> says no, 
we don't want to do it, right? And the charter of the company, in fact, what they called it in Britain, the constitution of the company, and what I tell my, teach my students is basically, you know, the corporate charter is basically the constitution, the bylaws is basically the statutes, and then you've got like a bunch of regulations and stuff, employee manuals, whatever else, you know, it's almost a one-to-one -one match. The constitution or the charter said that in order to overrule the board and get rid of the directors, whatever else, you needed 75% of the votes. So what did this guy do? He went to the court and he said, listen, I control a majority of the shares. That's enough to like vote in the next set of directors. And like, this is a democracy, right? Like I have 50% of the votes. I should absolutely be able to do this thing. You know, this company has been around for a long time. Like the fact they put 70% in, 75% in like years and years ago, that should not bind me today. Like the times have changed. If we're going to have the type of economy that we need, the type of industrial policy we need, we cannot be bound to these crazy things in the past, right? And he says all this stuff. And I look at my students when I teach this class, and I know most of them are not originalists. And I'm like, how many of you think this guy should win? And nobody raises their hands. Why not? Because everybody can read the stinking charter that says you've got to have 75% of the votes to overturn the board right? This is just law, right? You started this in contracts, right? You read the document, you look at the words, you say, is there any, do like the people who paint houses, do they mean something special when they do this? Or, you know, is there something particular about the industry? So I need to understand the context of what's going on here. But this interpretation of legal text in their historical and, you know, appropriate context is just what it means to be a lawyer and a judge, right? And so in some sense, it, I, it has always boggled me that we elevate this you know, to some like special thing you know, called originalism when it's really just being a lawyer, right? <laughs> um, now, the problem is for a long time, judges viewed themselves as being advocates for, a, you know, an outcome, right? So I, I, one thing I'll say is I think everybody, every, everybody's an originalist in one form or fashion, right? So some people just think like the irrelevant original ground, you know, ground norm is the Constitution. Other people think it's the Warren Court, other people think it's like, you know, the New Deal. Other people think it's the New York Times editorial page. <laughs> Other people think it's Twitter. You know, but everybody's an originalist to something. There's something that, like, formed your view about the world that you're committed to. In like, the old Onion headline, man passionately convinced, the, you know, to defend the Constitution as he understands it to me. Right? <laughs> notion. Um, and so, like, this is... Um, like, everybody is sort of like that, but I mean, originalism is, you know, insofar as originalism is a unique thing, it's a group of people who think, like, no, 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 it's actually what, this is the point, right? Like, when they wrote the thing, right? And that's the traditional legal move. Now, there is a bit of, there over the past, like, several decades, there's been a whole bunch of, like, internal fights among originalists about whether it's um, original intent or original public meaning, I, I think it's a mistake to get hung up on that because basically when people talked about original intent, they said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to go read Alexander Hamilton, I'm going to read Jay, and I'm going to read the Federalist Papers because these are the guys who are like writing the thing and this is what they intended. And then be like, no, 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 you got to do the public meaning. So what you got to do is you got to read the Federalist Papers because that was published in the newspapers and that's what the public understood them to mean. And I'm like, I think that's the same Federalist Paper. And so like, I mean, on the margin, there might be some differences, but I think like in the main... It roughly works out to be the same, but original public meaning does point to something, I think, interesting, right? The original points you to, that means then, not the later public meaning. Right? Why is that important? I don't think that Kari Lake should be the next senator, or not, should not have won the governor's mansion in Arizona because of the Republican form of government clause, right? I don't think she could have said, like, well, you know, the Constitution guarantees a Republican form of government. I'm the Republican, so I should win, you know, like and under some sort of like textualist nonsense, I guess you could get there. Um, but that strikes me as stupid. Um, and I think we should be able to say that. Similarly, like, you know, we shouldn't worry about original private meanings, right? So it's the original public meaning that governs. And so the fact that a legislator or, you know, James Madison might have had like, I secretly meant this thing and wah ha 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 ha, now you was doing it. No, that's, that's bonkers also, right? And so I think like there is something important in the phrase original public meaning, but in many ways, again, it's just what we do as lawyers. That said, I do think, um, and this is where I'd be really interested to get um, Sai's view on things. I do think originalism um, is suffering in some sense and it's sort of like popular, like there's a, there is a, some fractures between kind of its academic practitioners, it's kind of public facing, like political view, the Republican Party has basically made originalism 
like its lead issue for the past 30 years to take over the Supreme Court. And it's been very successful as an electoral issue. The Republican Party has been very successful. And now there's like six Republicans on the Supreme Court. Um, and so, but like the public facing view and then the actual practice of it by judges. And I think, I think there's a little bit of space there in ways that I think are unhelpful. And so I would like to propose um, a kind of more rigorous way of actually doing originalism than what I, than, than I this is going to restate a lot of things, but I think maybe this would be helpful. So I'm, I'm a, I took a graduate microeconomics class when I was in graduate school. If you can all avoid that, you should, um, <laughs> unless you just really love real analysis. Um, but you know, one of the really interesting things about that is you, you spend a fair bit of time talking about like the theory of decision making in a very rigorous way. Right? So what does this mean? When you want to make a decision, so suppose you want to go to the grocery store, right? And you think, what would I like to get from the grocery store? Your options are constrained. You can only buy the things if they are in the grocery store. You can only buy a bundle of things that you have the money for, right? You can only buy the things that you can fit in your car on the way home. If it is 1580 and you want to go buy an iPhone, good luck. There's no iPhone in 1580. That is not one of the possible options that you have. If you're the Connecticut Yankee King Arthur's Court, tough cookies, right? Like, it's just not there anymore. So you are constrained in the choices you have, right? And so I think what we need to... The, once you have the, once you are at the store and you know how much money you have, you have options about what you want to buy, right? And so you could just go buy all of the buttermilk you want, but that seems like a really bad idea because there's other things you wanted to buy more than just all buttermilk. And so you go into the store and you come out with the best of the possible options, the best mix of the possible options you could. And we call those preference orderings, right? All of the different things you could have bought, you bought the thing that you wanted the best. And I think a mistake that people make is they confuse theories of interpretation that are about constraining the set of things that are possible and the theories that are about making like a preference order over things, right? So I think textualism, like a strict form of textualism, that's a constraining type of thing. Originalism is a constraining thing, right? Purposivism, like fairness, justice, proportionality, things like that, that's a preference ordering. Right? Like, those are things where we're like, okay, once we're in the set, we're, you know, how do we order the possible things? I think what we've, like, observed for a long time, I think why there was such a strong reaction to, say, like, the Warren Court and the Earl Burr Court, is that they were, com they were completely unconcerned with anything approaching a constraining thing. They only had preference orderings. They looked at the universe of, like, things that they could imagine happening, and they said, this is what it shall be. Right? And they were completely unconstrained. And so this is why all of the early, like, you know, Bork and Scalia stuff is about, like, constraining judges. Really what I think, like, that's true and effective, but what we really we're trying to do is we're trying to constrain, find a way to constrain the possible legal options. That's a constraining thing. Now, I think what's a challenge is that sometimes when you do the constraining, there's more than one option in the set, right? And then what do you do? And I think we run into a real problem because originalists want to, like, in, like, so I would not say this, right? I would not say this. Most people who think about it would not say this. But a lot of people say, like, oh, I want to know the original public meaning, the one true public meaning that everyone knew at the time and we can absolutely discover with 100% accuracy and it'll be a, the set will be a singleton. There will only be one possible outcome. Look, if that happens, that's fantastic, and that's the right answer. Like, you know, that's, you know, if that's the one, if the only thing you can buy in the store is the last gallon of milk and you want the milk, then, like, that's what you're buying. There was one thing in the store, right? But, you know, sometimes there's more in there. I'll tell you the trickier one that I've, and hopefully you know somebody who can help me with this, but what do you do if there's nothing, right? What if there is just, like, no understanding about what it could mean? Like, and I just got, I got, like, not in the sense that, like, oh, I couldn't tell you, like, there's a whole bunch of different options, but what if, in the way I will describe in a moment, what if, like, it's almost a null set. Like, there's nothing that actually established the public meaning. There's no agreeable public meaning about what this would mean. Like, how do you handle that? But I, so I think the problem we run into today is that a bunch of originalists want to use originalism not just as a constraining thing, but also as a, this one is the more originalist of the original things. And so you see this, like, there's a whole group of people that are into something called um, corpus linguistics where they try to get all these dictionaries and stuff, and they try to say, well, you know, 86.2% of the time it meant this thing, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's fine, but, like, that means there's a 
I don't know, this is 86.2, that means there's a 13.8% chance that you're wrong, and I don't really want to, like, you know, that if I'm deciding a bunch of cases, that's going to bite me in the butt 13.2% of the time, and I don't really want to be wrong that often. So this sort of, like, I'm going to try to, like, turn this into a preference ordering based on a horse race of how many times words appeared co-located with other words strikes me as, like, a fundamental misunderstanding of what originalism is trying to do, which is merely to constrain the choice set. Trying to be more originalist than D is a bad idea. And here's where I think um, I might be slightly more aggressive than, than Psy. Because I do think, in some sense, there is, law has, and we look for legitimacy in law in a couple of different, a few different ways, right? So some people think, like, you know, law has to be predictable, right? Otherwise, it's not, like, legitimate. It has to be, you know, just in some kind of, like, particular sense, right? And in these ways, I think, you know, these are also in some sense constraints, right? There are these external things like what it is to be a law is to satisfy certain things. These are external constraints on the nature of law. But I think the Constitution provides something that looks like an internal constraint on what it is to be a law that is consistent with this Constitution. And here, I think um, I would propose something like what does it mean that something is like the law? What does it mean that something is in the Constitution? It means that a sufficient selectorate of people, a sufficient if it's a statute, a sufficient number of people in the House, in the Senate, and most likely the President, agreed that this thing should be the law, right? And I think, you know, that is important information about what the law is. So the notion that I could just, like, read the text of the statute and read some newspaper coverage of it and think about what a reasonable person would have thought, I think all that's important. I think that goes to, like, the nature of law is it needs to be publicly understandable, it needs to provide, like, clearer evidence of what's going on. All that's true. But if for it to be a law consistent with the Constitution, it also needs to be the type of thing that garnered support from these folks, right? And these folks had a view on what this policy would be. So to me, what, a, what is a law? I'm a math nerd, right? So a law is a function. You remember this? Like when you had like a seventh grade and you had to like, you had the x-axis and the y-axis and like every point of the x-axis went to this point of the y-axis. A function is a map that says, give me an x and I'll give you a y. And why I think a law is a function, it says, give me a case and I'll give you an outcome. I think that's what a law is, right? And so fundamentally, I don't think we can understand a law internal to a constitutional law that we have without understanding what they thought the outcomes of these cases would be. I don't think they told us the outcome of everything. I think they did speak in broad terms and general principles. But I do think for it to be consistent with the Constitution, it needs to be an understanding. It needs The law that the judge is proposing to apply here needs to be the type of law that was a, like, they knew they were doing something like this. Right? So here's a modest proposal, and I'll leave you with this on the way out. I would suggest, as a as just a rudimentary baseline to get that idea rolling, that if your interpretation of this law, if that if the legislature that passed this statute had known, or the passed that approved this constitutional provision, if they had known it would lead to this outcome, they would not have passed it. Maybe they would have even like unanimously voted against it, right? If so, that strikes me as a sufficient reason to say this outcome is not consistent with the Constitution, right? Because what does it mean to be part of the Constitution? It means that a sufficient number of people thought this was the rule or this is the type of rule that we are on board with, right? And if you look at this and you say there's no way they thought this was like, they would have run screaming from the hills, to the hills then I think that that can't be. Um, an originalist interpretation. That can't be a consistent view. Um, I don't think that's a complete comprehensive view, but I think that's a starting place for us to like take the next step um, to understand how originalism can play out going forward. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to sit down. You're going to stand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm the old person. I, I need a chair. I'm a pain or something. <laughs> Well, I can hide. This is good. So, I mean, just, the, I, you know, I don't know if Ben had a chance to, to riff off whatever I said. I, I agree with, you know, I think almost all of what Ben said. I think the, the oath point is interesting, and it's been written about by, by originalists. And I, I think I used to have Ben's view, but I, I don't think so anymore. And it really turns on what is a, 
What does Justice Breyer think he's taking an oath to when he takes the oath? And I think on on you know Ben's account, he's taking an oath to you know the Constitution found in the Westlaw reprint, whatever, right? And to the original understanding of it. But I don't think that's what you know Justice Breyer thinks he's doing. I think he's saying, yeah, there's this Constitution, but there's all the other stuff that's part of our Constitution that's not in the text, like our precedents, our practices, uh, et cetera. And I think I'm taking a note to that as well, uh, to try to make sense of the Constitution in light of all of these, these things. And, and I think the way to think about it is, you know, like, uh, let's go back to, you know, a version of my hypothetical, right? Ben and I both agree to listen to Paul. We both take a note to follow Paul. But Ben has in mind Paul Mahoney. And I have in mind, you know. Please say Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney, sure, Paul McCartney. <laughs> We're both being true to the oath as we understand it, right? And we have different conceptions of what Paul, which Paul we're talking about. And I, so I don't, like, I don't think, there, there might be some judges who say, like, I know what it means, but I'm not going to follow it. But I think most, I think most progressive judges just have a different conception of what it is they're taking an oath to. And so that's why they don't think that they're violating their oath, even though, you know, it might appear as if they are, but that's because the people who think that they are have a very clear concept of the Constitution that is greatly different than the one that's in the mind of a Breyer, Ginsburg, Kagan, or Sotomayor. Um, so the only thing I would say, so I was, I was taking your hypothetical to be that I am like I can do originalism, and I agree with the original method, and this is what I understand the Constitution to be. But even then, I don't have to like I can think it's a bad idea. So Breyer would not be in that. Breyer might be like, I know this is what originals think, but I'm not an originalist, and so I don't think that's what the Constitution means. And so your your caveat oh, right. would apply oh, to Breyer. Yeah. I mean, what I disagree with Breyer is that Breyer would have a multi-factor test that would be comprehensible to anybody except Breyer about what the Constitution. <laughs> is. Other than that, like yeah, I mean, you know, Justice Breyer is a wonderful person. Um, he does have a lot of multi-factor tests, but we all have a lot of multi-factor tests, right? How did you decide to come here? Looked at the speakers. Who are these people? You looked at the food. It's Chick Fil A. You looked at the topic. Huh. When are they going to serve food? How hungry am I? That's a multi-factor test. And each of you will come to different conclusions. You all came here, but there were other people like, no way. They don't give us food till the end. <laughs> I'm really hungry. Um, and other people, you know, so like, that was a binary choice, either you're here or not, but you could, you know, you imagine like a, you know, whatever, is it called a scale? You're the math person, a scaler choice, right? Like I'll be here for 10 minutes and then leave, right? And, or I'll come in late to grab the lunch and leave. So I, I think, you know, I, 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 he, it's, you know, the reason why he gets a bad, you know, rap for multi-factor test is because of course it leads to the conclusion that people come to different conclusions about what the constitution means just in the way that people come to different conclusions about whether to come to this lunch. Um, maybe that's, it's more susceptible to that problem than originalism, but as Ben said, and I think he's right to say it, you're not always going to come to a conclusion about what the meaning of the text was. You're going to be, you're going to find evidence of multiple meanings, right? And then you're going to have to choose. And, you know, you might think you're relying upon a multi-factor test to figure out the multi which are the multiple meanings. And you might think you're relying on a multi-factor test to figure out the single meaning, right? What do originalists say they're looking at? Text, structure, history, right? Maybe intentions. Well, those are multiple factors, right? It's not just, like, it's not just, you know, you know, like, here's a, here's a single factor test, right? At 12 o'clock, I eat lunch. Like, there's no other factor. Um, but that's not the way most people make decisions. And it's not even, the, it's not the way people make sense of text, right? They don't just say, I'm only going to read the text. I'm going to think about the context and maybe what the person was trying to accomplish and, you know, whether this outcome is so bad that the person couldn't have been contemplating it. Um, so, I don't know. I, I, it shouldn't be about Ben and I. It should be about you. And I feel bad for my joke, though. <laughs> well, oh, why? Why? <laughs> I can give you multiple reasons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if there are no questions, we'll just get to lunch. <laughs> so uh, I had a question for you, uh, Professor Johnson. Uh, thank you for coming. But I 
didn't know exactly what you meant by if there's a, <coughs> it's a sufficient reason if the legislative had enacted the law to see it applied in a case that if they didn't like the outcome, we shouldn't read it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes me think of these statutes that said if you were to serve on a grand jury, mm -hmm. to be eligible, you had to be a, a voting member. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was originally written in, let's say, it was Massachusetts, mm -hmm. that was just men. Mm -hmm. 19th Amendment comes around, women can vote. Now suddenly they're in that class. Sure. So even though none of those people would have voted for women to be in grand jury, suddenly that seems to be the meaning. Mm -hmm. Yet they never would have voted for that outcome. So is that enough to say, oh, voting member now means a male voting member? So so here, here's what I would say is that, um, so as I said, it's like it's a function, right? So the question is like, what's the, what's the function going to operate as? So you might think in the, so they, they passed this statute in, I don't know, 1764 yeah. or whatever, I don't know. Um, and so the question would be, should you have a non-land-owning male on a grand jury in 1765 when you're later, right? Um, consistent with that law, no, right? And like that, <laughs> clearly that would be the interpretation of that law. Um, now, later on, we've changed who is in the class of voters, Right. And so the, the function says, I'm presented with a person. I inquire, is this person a voter? If so, they go on the grand jury. That is entirely consistent with what they understood them to be doing. We are, we are mapping the class of voters into the stuff. The fact that we have subsequently changed who the class of voters is is not at all a problem, right? Um, so I don't think that you have to, I don't think everything, the dead hand does not like grab everything and such that like these are the statutes and they wrote the constitution against the backdrop of these statutes and so you also can't change the statutes. I don't think that's true at all. Um, and I do think that you run into hard problems. And so I said like the harder problem to me that I'm trying to figure out is what do you do in a situation where there's no good answer at all, right? So I said there's other external constraints. So, for instance, like, I think it would be, uh, I'm, I'm with Martin Luther King, an unjust law is no law at all, right? So I think, like, a statute that says we will not, federal courts will not be open to women, right? Like, women cannot bring, you know, cases in throw. I think that would be unconstitutional. I think it would be wrong, right? Let's set aside whether or not it's unconstitutional. I think it would be wrong, right? And so it might be that you would say that's not a valid law, right? Because, we, you know, law must not only be consistent with the Constitution, it must also be, like, just in some important sense, Right. And so like this thing, there like there is not an actual answer in the choice set. Right. Because I don't have an answer that is both like predictable or completely just or like satisfies this kind of like democratic accountability mechanism I was talking about. And what do you do when it's like an empty set is the really hard question. Right. And I think what you're pointing to is, you know, when you're trying to take laws that were written in ways that we now understand to be like deeply wrong and unjust in ways that we would probably want to have some sort of like strong fence around it and say like, no, that's not like, not, not okay. Right. So what do you do when those laws are here? I the one you gave me is kind of easy, right? Because I could just like dump it into that situation. What do you do in like a harder case that we, I'm sure we come up with. And there, I think we just have to think harder about what do you do if it's like, like, no, I, I literally just have nothing to say here. And then you run into like, what's your default position going to be? Is it, is your default position that Congress can just like do whatever it wants or like Congress can't do it or like, but you sort of have to fall back to some like previous default, I think. And that's why I think this is a much harder question. I've, and I'd be really interested if anybody's written about this because I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, I think you're thinking along the right, you're pushing along the right angle, right? Push that. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think one way of, thinking about it is to say, well, there's there's two different statutes they could enact. One would be, you know, um, what is it? It's, the jury, it's a jury statute. Is that what it was? Yes. So um, there's one jury statute that says if you if you vote, you, you can serve on a jury. There's another jury statute that says if, you're, if you vote and you're a male, you can serve on a jury. And, and the question is, do we think they've enacted a second statute? And I can I can actually conceive of circumstances where they just say vote and but they actually mean both, but I could also perceive of circumstances where they only say one and they only mean one, and they just have some background assumption about who will vote that changes over time and it's they just, but they didn't enact the rule um, that says you have to be a male to serve on a jury, and again like I you know I think you could be a you know. So you, there's sort of like, there's a textualist answer, which is that's just not part of the rule. And 
there could be an intentionalist answer that it's it's not part of the rule. But if you're an intentionalist, there could be an intentionalist answer that it is part of the rule. And then the answer would be, you know, uh, unless you think the subsequent statute that allowed women to vote also amended this statute implicitly, then they wouldn't be able to serve. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think the, you know, I, I, the, there's one thing to think that the statute has a consequence. It's another thing to think that that's the, that's the point of the statute, right? And, and I don't know if, it, if, if, the, if, if the consequence is always logically part of the statute. But it's, it's a wonderful question. Is um, originalism the methodology of constitutional interpretation that the founders used, or is it something that came onto the scene later on? I'll, this is your... Well, why don't we both take it up? But I, I think, you know, this, this word wasn't used at the time. Um, but I do think people thought that the meaning of the Constitution was fixed at an act. And then, of course, there'd be disagreements about what it meant. Of course, there were disagreements in 1789 about what the Constitution meant. There were disagreements in 1788 about the proposed Constitution and what it meant, right? Anti-Federalists would say one thing, and Federalists would say another, and then that sort of debate continues on. Um, but what I, don't, what I don't see is people saying, oh, that's what it meant yesterday, but today it means something else. Um, I, I don't see that kind of argument, which is quite common today, right? Um, I don't see an argument for dynamic interpretation or living interpretation. So I think they were originalists um, uh, in the sense of having a, having a sense that the meaning of a, a legal document is fixed at the time, even if the interpreter doesn't quite know yet what it means because they haven't figured out what any particular provision means, even though they agree with the premise that the meaning is fixed at the time one. But yeah, I mean, if you read a, like a Marshall opinion, I think you will see arguments of, of the sort that uh, Justice Scalia or Justice Thomas would make today. I say of the sort because he's not as textualist as Justice Scalia was. Um, he's more open to uh, intent or, or purpose than I think Justice Scalia was. Um, but a lot of the moves are the same. He's also open to consequentialist arguments of the sort that like uh, Justice Breyer would make. So, I, you know, I think Justice Scalia is both an originalist but also a believer in judicial restraint. He's an originalist but also a believer in the New Deal settlement. Those things aren't necessarily consistent, right? Um, imagine a constitutional provision which says judges can make up new rules. That's not consistent with judicial constraint, but its original meaning would imply that judges can make up new rules, right? New, new rights. Justice Bork, Judge Bork, it was Ju Judge Bork, it should have been justice. He had, a, he had a problem with the Ninth Amendment. He said it was an ink blot. It's not an ink blot. I've read it. If it's an ink blot, we couldn't read it. <laughs> it says the enumeration of particular rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage the existence of other rights. It's a rule of construction which says, don't think that these are the only rights. Does it require that there be other rights? Not logically, but what's the point of putting that in if there aren't any other rights? So Scalia and Bork are reacting to the Warren Court. The Warren Court seems to be making stuff up. They seem to be unmoored to text. And so, you know, the originalism of Scalia and Bork is very about, much about judicial restraint and saying that the only rights that are in the Constitution, or the only rights the Constitution protects are the ones specified. And then comes Justice Thomas, who doesn't have that view, I don't think, um, um, who's not all about judicial restraint, because he's not only thinking about the Warren Court, he's thinking about the New Deal and how wrong it was, according to him. Well, that involves less judicial restraint, right? Saying that Congress can't pass a statute is not an epitome of judicial constraint, right? Saying that the, you know, the marijuana, what is it, the Marijuana Controlled Substances Act is unconstitutional is not, you know, it's not judicially restrained as, as normally understood. Justice Scalia said it was constitutional, right, under some really expansive understanding of the Commerce Clause. Justice, Justice Thomas and, you know, O'Connor and Rehnquist disagreed. 
I think it was the right say no to drugs clause in the Constitution. Right. Was mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, Justice Scalia was never on board for rethinking federalism in the same way that Justice Thomas was. He he came along in, in many respects, but that wasn't his issue. Uh, his issue was separation of powers and originalism, um, but not when it came to the Commerce Clause, or at least not as much as Justice Thomas, right? I mean, I think he took, you know, if you've, if you've had con law, you know, this is the Raich case. Uh, if you haven't had con, con law, it's also the Raich case. <laughs> but there's also this case called Wicker versus Filburn, where the Congress is regulating wheat production by a farmer. And, um, you know, I think Justice Thomas thinks it's absolutely wrong, and Justice Scalia treated it as if it, you know, as if it were a good law that he was going to follow. So I don't even know what your question was, but I probably have said too much. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you want to have a follow up, please. Time for one more question. It's um, 30. I have two, like, potentially related questions. Oh. I'll answer quickly. Okay. Um, my first question is, um, just to make sure I understand, like, if we're thinking about originalism kind of as a theory of interpretation, and particularly as a constraining principle, let's say it leads to, and it's not like a, a way to kind of bring preferences, um, let's say it leads to, like, it constrains us to, like, three particularly, like, absurd outcomes. Would you say that uh, according to like an originalist judge, the judge should make should not make any sort of like normative judgments or normative values. It just should apply at least one of those three absurd outcomes, just to make sure I understand kind of like what the methodology actually is. Yeah. So I think my view is that um, the judge takes the law as he finds it, and if the law is absurd, he's stuck with an absurd law, right? Um, so if you know, if, if basically what I've got is this, just like you pass this statute that like you know. You have to, you have to walk your giraffes on Thursday morning. I'm like, I'm like okay, I, I guess that's sure. Um, like, I guess that's the law. It might be dumb, but that's the law. I mean, I will say the judge always has the option of like resigning. You know, if it, if it's like if it's like unconscionable, right? If it's like I can't do this, and I think that's that's something that judges ought to do um, from time to time. But I think like if if a judge apply if a judge says like look this is what the law meant when they passed it and it's absurd either they pass an absurd law in which case i'm like guys this is stupid y'all really got to change it you know um, or you go back and be like i don't these people aren't really that crazy they, i probably did something wrong and i should go back to the drawing board and look again i would maybe start there and then i would like call on them to update the law but go ahead you had a second question uh, i i don't know if we have time for me to follow up with that go for it oh okay well, I want to respond too, so we're going to eat yeah. into your lunch. I guess my absurd, it could also be like deeply immoral or sure. like say like, you know, and so, um, so, so long as it's essentially applying the law as it was, as like, it's as the originalist interpretation is leading it to mm -hmm. apply it, then like it, you should apply it or resign or go back to the drawing board and kind of see if your methodology and application is correct. So those, um, is that, is that correct? Yeah, so for instance, I think mandatory minimum sentences on a bunch of things are, like, deeply immoral. Um, and I think, like, they're really awful. Um, does that mean they're not the law? No. I mean, I think they're clearly the law. And I think they're the law because they, these people, like, wrote them because we wanted to be tough on crime and whatever else. It's like, that's, that's what they said, that's what they meant, like, that's what the law is. And I think it's deeply immoral. But the, so the question is, if you're the judge, are you going to either follow the law? Are you going to substitute your preferences for the law? Or are you going to resign? I think that's just the... Those are the options, I think. So, uh, you know, Bertie uh, is the editor-in-chief of the uh, Virginia Law Review, but more importantly, she was my student. <laughs> um, she's, she's wonderful. And she sat in the back of the class, just like she's standing now in the back of this class. Um, I, there's, I mean, there's ways of dealing with absurdity. And so there's this doctrine in statutory interpretation called the absurdity doctrine yes. that, that people follow. And what they say is if... If, you know, the, the best reading of the statute is that it leads to an absurdity, then we need to re-understand the statute. And, and there are textualists who do this. And, and, of course, one response is, great, thank God they're not reading the statute to be absurd. But another question would be, well, why? Because under your view, this, this is the statute that was passed, and you're not, your job isn't to make it better, it's just to enforce it. And, of course, there's always, a, there's always a chance that what you think is absurd as the judge isn't absurd to them. So, you know, so there are textbooks who disagree with this absurdity doctrine, even as others agree with it. 
And then the unjust point, I mean, I think, let's just take, you know, go back to abortion. A, a state, you know, one state makes it legal to have an abortion. One state makes it illegal to have an abortion. Half the country thinks it's immoral in one state, and half the country thinks it's immoral in the other. I mean, could it, could it be the case that both judges and, you know, judges in both states are allowed to just say, because it's immoral, I'm going to ignore the statute, and we have the converse of, the, you know, statutes in both states. I, I mean, we know that there are unjust laws, right? We know that there are illegal laws, sorry, immoral laws. They've always been around. And we know there are bad people. They've always been around. The, the question would be, you know, do we think the Constitution authorizes, say, a judge to just say whatever I think is immoral is unconstitutional? And can I imagine that a Constitution like that? Of course, we just did. But would it be a good one? I'm not sure, right? Because it would just mean that the judges decide, you know, whether this minimum wage is too low or whether paying 20% on your taxes is too high. Right? I mean, you don't, you, you know, you must, you, you'd be, it's, it's surprising what people think is immoral, right? Some people think like having a progressive tax rate is morally required. Other people think it's morally <laughs> repugnant, right? Um, so I, I think any theory which says the judges just gets to decide what's immoral and therefore unconstitutional, you can have that view, but then you really need to think hard, long and hard about what you're going to do about all the judges that don't have your theory of morality. And I don't know of a constitution that's written like that. Like typically, Israel. The, well, there is no constitution in Israel, right? That's like, isn't it like the, there's just they're just kind of. I mean, I don't making it up, right? There's no written constitution in Israel. Um, so, uh, so I don't know. I mean, you know, Bertie has asked a, a characteristically good question and one which we will end uh, this discussion. I, I just want to say one last thing to that, though. And I think that if we reach the point, and I think this is going to come to what I was talking about, if we reach the point where the judges are our moral arbiters, the politics is broken down, right? So we're supposed to, like, because it's precisely our disagreements over kind of, like, core issues of, like, right and wrong and how we want the world to be, that we're supposed to, like, work out and process through in ordinary politics, through elections and like conversations over the water cooler and whatever else. Like that's where we're supposed to do this stuff. If it gets to the point where we have to go to a judge to sort out a moral question, then that signals that like our, we, our politics failed at this point already. Um, and that's inevitable because as I said, we're always going to have unjust laws because unjust people are going to make unjust laws. And so is it ultimately, there are going to be times it has to come to the judge, but we should recognize it as a failure when it does. And second, judges should not be in the business of trying to generate such things, right? So when judges, like, go out of their way to try to say, like, I am going to step in here and invoke my moral view about the world, even though no one really asked, right? Or, like, even though this is deeply contested in the world out there, then what that, that is short-circuiting politics' ability to actually reach these consensus, right? Because, like, Amer um, uh, Linda Greenhouse and Reva Siegel have written really interesting work on kind of abortion in the 20th century, that the country was on its way to a national consensus on abortion policy, that the Supreme Court short-circuited and blew up into the most contentious issue of the 20th century, precisely because the court interrupted the political process involved in, like, trying to work out moral questions for a, a large community. Um, and so when the court does that type of stuff, I mean, I think it makes politics affirmatively worse. Thank our panelists again.